One more time and give him a little bit of praise for his goodness, for his great mercy. He's so wonderful. How many know that you're serving a wonderful, wonderful God? Amen. Maybe see it if you like this morning. This has been a, an amazing season of changes and turnarounds, and I am so thankful. We're talking about prayer walks where things are happening. People are uh, calling in or texting in from across the country, needing prayer, needing agreement. And many times after a person comes to a place where they need an answer, they need healing, uh, God gives the miracle, and they get so excited, they forget to come back and say, hey, it worked. But how many of you know all things work together for the good? I'm going to say that again. All things work together for the good. Anything you place in God's hands will change. There's never been a person that walked into the presence of the Lord that was not changed. Some received him as Savior and lived for eternity. How many of there's other people, they were changed because they were locked into rebellion? Don't be that person. There are people that made a choice not to want him as we have been studying about the Jewish custom uh, in the time of Jesus. All of his 33 and a half years, many of them tried to kill him and take him out. How many know they were locked into hate and anger and unforgiveness? They would not allow him to be the blessing. But I want you to understand, we're not a part of that crowd. We're a part of the people that are going to watch God change everything we put in his hand and every prayer that we pray is going to have an answer because we pray according to his will. How many believe that we have to pray according to his will? Don't be praising some, praying some crazy stuff, wanting God to glorify it. But he said, if you pray according to his will, he always hears or responds, and that's for his glory. Can somebody say this with me? What's going on right now, it will turn. Anybody believe that's true? It will turn. Say it. It will turn. If you'd like to go with me to Scripture for the next few hours, it's Luke 21. And it's exciting because we need to know that the Word is not only something we can learn, memorize, quote, but we also have to realize there's a time we have to apply it, and not just once, but every day. How many of you keep your mind on the Lord when you're not working, when you're not cooking, when you're not cleaning or something else, and your mind has to be focused on details? How many of you let your mind go right back to the promises of God and to the presence of the Lord? That's how you walk in victory. The Word said, Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Who? The one whose mind is stayed on him. We're not supposed to have a Sunday morning mentality, a Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday mentality. We're supposed to have a mind that is willing to love him and entertain the presence of God 24-7. How many know that's not asking too much of God? Especially when he owns us and made us, keeps us alive and blesses us. I want you to read this with me if you will. This is some of the end time things that are talking about that are going to take place, and I'm not going to go into all of those, but I really think it's important that we recognize what is taking place. Look at verse number eight. And he said, take heed that you be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ. And the time draws near, but go ye not uh, therefore after them. How many of you understand when he's present or he's coming, you'll know it. And when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end is, is by and by. He said to them, nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilence and fearful sights and great signs shall there be in the heaven. 
How many of you realize that we're living in an hour where we've watched these things take place for a long time? But he said, the end is not yet, the end is still coming for us. How many of you know this world is going to remain forever, but how many understand it's going to change? Everything is going to change. And I believe that we're ready now to let God do whatever he wants to do. Anybody ready just to trust God completely? How many found out our way don't work? You can't make anything happen, but his way works and it always turns for a blessing. Look at verse number 12, but before these things, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you and deliver you up in the synagogues and into the prisons, being brought before the kings and the rulers for my name's sake. I want to explain just so you can do this in a study. Much of what has just been spoken by the word of the Lord for the people, the Lord has spoken. He said, this generation is not going to pass until you witness these things. How many of you know history repeats itself? There's things that are happening now that happened in the Old Covenant. They're happening in the New Testament, and now they're happening again. But i got to tell you this. I'm glad that I'm in a kingdom where I don't have to worry about anything, anytime, anywhere, because I am in a kingdom that is going to serve the Lord and be blessed. I, I know Kathy and I put both the cars in to get some discounts on gas, $140. I said, don't look at the receipt, Kat. Don't look at it. <laughs> Anybody remember when gas was not that high? Isn't it amazing how the world is focused on gas prices? How many of you went for years and didn't even think about it? you kind of like the lady that just went in and said, give me $25 worth. Now, if you do that, you'll be going around the, the gas station, come right back. But how many of the Lord knows how to provide? I just want to say to everybody in this room, if you're a child of God, he's going to take care of you. And if I have to go to New York, how many of God will fill the gas tank? If I have to go to California and back, he'll feel the, come on, somebody say amen. God takes care of his kingdom, and he takes care of his people. Listen to verse number 13. He's talking about whatever's going on in your life and whatever area of life that you're in. I think everybody in this room is facing something right now. Every one of you are going through a time. It's a dilemma. It's a question. It's confusion. And if you're not going through it and you're not worried about it, how many, everybody around you seems to be bummed out by something right now. So you need to be an encouragement. I want you to say it. I'm an encouragement. I go up to your neighbor and tell him, you need some? I'm an encourager. That's my calling. Well, well, you need to be a prophet. You need to be a pastor. No, you don't. You need to do what you're called to do. Everybody is an encourager. Everybody's a blessing. How many of you are a blessing? How many, when you walk in the room, everybody smiles and says, they're here. How many of you, when you walk in the room, people head to the back door? Don't be that person. Everybody say, don't be that person. I want you to listen to this. When all these negative things, is what he's saying, come against you, whatever time frame you're in on earth, it shall turn to you for a testimony. I'm going to stop right there and meddle for a minute. Isn't it amazing that we sometimes forget whose we are and who we are? When I was a child, we were not rich, but I knew that by supper time, I can go home and mama got some fried potatoes and pinto beans. Y'all still with me? That might be all we had, but you can't get better food than that. I can see me looking at me like, what's that? Okay, we'll have a dinner and we'll fix you something. I knew that I was going to be provided for. I knew that no matter what the situation, when I got to daddy's house, he was going to take care of his kids. Not because we were all perfect and wonderful. Amen. But because we belonged to him and we were his. How many of you recognize he knew we were his children? His responsibility was to take care of us, and he did a good job doing that. But i got to also tell you this. How many of you know God knows you belong to him, and it would really make God look bad if he couldn't help you? How many? He doesn't forsake anybody. As a matter of fact, he put it down in black and white and red. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end. How many of you understand? He's always with us. I've been in planes crossing America and other places in the world, and I found out that when I'm in that plane and the engines are sputtering and they start dropping a few hundred feet and there's a turbulence going on, I realize my daddy knows I'm on this airplane and God has told me already to go where he sent me and I got a round trip ticket, and so God remembers that, he knows that. Our problem is we forget that God is God. Would everybody say what I'm going through it will turn. Well, I want it to turn right now. You know what we've been talking about a lot, and I've heard it through ministry for about a month. What we don't like about God is that he doesn't always answer quickly. Am I right? 
somebody came in a service and they got a word God was going to give them the desire of their heart and they was mad by next Sunday because they hadn't found a husband yet. I thought God was going to give me the desire of my heart. Hold on. God might have to birth somebody that's <laughs> not already formed in their weirdness and give you a brand new friend. Okay. How many know God always works in his time? He makes everything beautiful in his time. Why did Solomon say that? It's because he knows your time and my time mean it's not ready yet. When I'm praying, God has to work on everybody in the, in, in, in the whole sphere of the influence, everybody that I'm praying about, and he has to work on their attitude, and they have to work on that person, and every detail has to be formed before he can bless my life. But how many of God knows that in advance? Just want to ask you this question. Have you ever wondered why, if you're a child of God, you have to go through stuff? God help me say this delicately. Why is the Bible written and much of it is about people that went through terrible situations? Why? Because when you're called, they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Well, then I don't want to be godly. Yeah, you do. You just need to learn how to suffer the persecution right. Anybody ever been talked about, lied on, cheated, hated, dissed, kicked out, abandoned? Anybody? then you know what I'm talking about. People can't be trusted to be your God. Only God can be trusted to be your God. I, I went through something, and it, it really hit me hard. We don't want to go through anything, but God uses bad stuff. Okay. How many wish you hadn't come till next week? Anybody remember the guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Anybody remember those guys, those three Hebrew children? What do you know about them? what they went through. If there had never been a fiery furnace, we wouldn't know them. They would have no value as far as we're concerned. But you know what? When they went through the fire, it turned from burning them up into a testimony. For thousands of years, people have been believing in God because if he can do it for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, somebody say if he can do it for them, they went through it, and what looked like burning death turned into a testimony. I'm just going to say it. I've never heard anybody else say it, so I'm going to say it. Every test is not to test and destroy. It's a test to prove to you that God is in the turning business. If you're going through a test, the money is getting ready to happen. If you get in a test, God is going to use it. Can I tell you that the only way that you can possibly have a testimony is to go through something? If I never had a problem, I'd never know God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in God could do. That's why you need stuff to go wrong so God can make it right and develop your faith. Oh, I want to be a strong Christian. If you never watch God work and he never answers a prayer, and if you never go through anything, you're still going to be at point A and never at point B. Why? Because God is developing us through the things that we go through. I, and there's another guy. One of their friends was named Daniel. What do you know about Daniel? Daniel and the... Why are you saying lion's den? Because he tested and proved himself pure to believe in God. These men did not know if God was going to deliver them. They didn't know if it's the end of their life. Or Okay, I'll say it. They could have thought, and this is what the three Hebrews said, we don't know if God's going to deliver us or not, but we're getting out of your hand. You lying God hater, we don't have to hang out with you anymore. We may die and go on to God. I don't know if you know this or not, but heaven's better than Hillsborough. How do I know that? Because the word said it. I got some awesome people already over there waiting on me. Come on. Every time we have a funeral, somebody said, heaven's getting sweeter. It's getting more alluring because a whole lot of our family and friends and loved ones are there. What would we know about Daniel if he had been consumed by the lions? You know what we would have known? In his test, he was faithful to a God he loved more than life. Why did God close the mouth of the lions? Because that was the way God was going to get the greater glory. I know anybody can be eaten by lions, but not everybody can be delivered from lions. Why did they go through that? For a testimony. All we would know about Daniel is he was over there, you know, in, in a foreign land, and they made him a leader among their people because he was smart. That wouldn't bless anybody. 
three Hebrew children would only be known as three men, that they, they got burned up because they wouldn't deny God. Can I just tell you, if God gets greater glory out of me burning in the fire and somebody says, man, that man loved God so much, he didn't care about life as much as he cared about eternal life. If that's my testimony, that's what I want to give God that glory. But it doesn't work that way. God said, I will always come and turn whatever you're going through for a testimony. Do you believe that? If you really believe that, then you realize I'm going through something that's getting ready to turn. In everything turn. You 60s people just grin, the rest of you look at me like I just made up a weird song. What did we say at the beginning of the year? This is a year that God is going to say, devil, you're coming at me to destroy. Turn it around. Because how many know God can cause even the enemy to be turned around? We have authority over all the, all, the, all the power of the enemy. So don't bum out because the devil's trying something. No, if you're going through something as a child of God, and you are, and you will, it's going to turn for a testimony. As a matter of fact, by the end of this year, a whole lot of you folks that are going through bummed out times right now, you're going to have a great big testimony, and you probably ought to write a book. Maybe you ought to go on Christian television and preach. I don't know what you need to do, but how many of you realize everything you go through turns for a testimony? We, we look at all these characters, and to save a few hours of time, I just want to give you some of my favorite people. There came a time where the great prophet Elijah, the greatest man of God on earth in his hour, whew, you know, if one day I was to call down fire from heaven and consume a sacrifice and all the four, 850 prophets of the devil were there cutting themselves and screaming and having a fit because their God wouldn't do anything but my God could call down fire, how many of you would be shouting for a week? Oh, man, that Elijah is a man of God. He trusts in God and God listens to him and, and, and honors him at the altar of sacrifice. But you got to understand something when Jezzy... Jezebel, <laughs> okay, she sent out a word and she said he is going to have his head taken off within 24 hours. The man that conquered 850 prophets and cut off their head and threw them in the brook, one screaming demonic lady persuaded him to stop believing in fullness for a little bit. Not putting him down. We've all doubted for a minute. Am I right? How many of you would like to have faith all the time? How many would like to be Christ-like all week? <laughs> How many would like to just not wait till you come in church and say, did anybody see that on Facebook this week of the lady at the gas pump had her hand on the gas pump? I rebuke the spirit of prices. I rebuke the high cost of, I rebuke that devil of gu gas, guzzling. I, re I, re and the I thought, man, I like that lady. <laughs> I don't think it worked for her, but how many of you understand? Sometimes we ought to celebrate in the world. Come on, we believe in God. All of us believe in God. We've been in church. But how many of you realize there's some people, they don't know that God is real. Next time you pray and you lay hands on the gas pump, shout a little bit. may not lower the gas pumps, but it will give you a testimony that you really believe God in weird situations. Okay. But notice this, God ministered to him and turned that attitude around. Some of you don't need a cancer report turned around. You need your attitude turned around. I've met some on-fire, Holy Ghost-filled, tongue-talking Christians that get a bad attitude and ruin their reputation. We're going to preach on attitudes and personalities one day. It might become a year-long series. Because how many know that's one thing you're going to fight? For, I don't care how anointed you are. One thing you're going to fight for the rest of your life is you, your personality, your choices. Amen. But see, God always turns it around. Now, we talk about who is the man that maybe suffered more than most in the Old Covenant? The one written about first is, is a man that was the wealthiest man of the East, and one day he lost his children, he lost his wealth, he lost his camels, he lost his workers, he lost everything. In a day, he lost it all. He had boils from his head to his feet. If you've ever had one boil, you'll understand the pain of Job. Came to a place that he got... Uh, in, in such a, a state of mind that he literally said, I wish I had never been born. How many of you know that's not a good way to live your life, wishing you'd never been born? Can you imagine that depression, that hopelessness? Get the tape from last week. Everybody say hopelessness. It doesn't belong in the body of Christ. It doesn't belong in the church. We got to get rid of it. It'll kill you. 
And Job was in that point, not for a long season, but he was at a point where lost his children, lost his wealth, lost everything. And his wife is saying, why don't you just cuss God out and die? How many of you know he didn't have anybody to turn to? His friends are mocking, making fun, lying about him. Here he's sitting in ashes all by himself, sitting with a broken pot, scratching the heads off of boils and bleeding and infection coming out of his body. Nobody can get any further into depression and pain and sorrow than Job. And his word was, I curse the day that I was born. Aren't you glad he didn't stay there? Brother Young, you don't know what I'm going through. Is it worse than Job? Is it even on the same page as Job? If God can restore Job and give him back double everything. Yes. And not only that, he let him live another extension of life in years, just to enjoy the kids and grandkids. Why? Because his depression turned around. You ought to write this on your forehead until it happens. Write it in Indel- or tattoo it there so you never forget it. Never mind. Say it. It's turning. It will turn. Well, Brother Young, yeah, but once I get through this, it'll be okay. I'll never go through anything else again. Yes, you will. And whatever that is, it will turn too. Because all things will work together for the good and for the glory of God. How many of you believe that? There are times we look at some of our heroes like David at a point of depression. Can you imagine what he must have felt like after he'd killed his best friend and covered it up and had an affair with a woman that ended up having a baby that had to die because of his disobedience? How many of you know, no matter how great you are in God, no matter how much of an orator you are or a wise preacher, it doesn't matter. You will always have to fight off your flesh or your flesh will consume you and it'll take away the joy and the glory of the God. I just got to tell you, I've been down. How many of you have ever been down how many of you're not still there how many of you got up (laughs) boy I'm glad you got up this morning with all the people that are on vacation all the people getting married and all the people doing stuff graduations how many we need some people that got up this morning and are celebrating in God I was coming in from a, a meeting in Rocky Mountain North Carolina many many years ago on a Sunday afternoon I would drive 90 miles down from Fayetteville have a service and come back for the night service And on my way back, I was listening to, quote, unquote, gospel music. And the song the guy was singing kind of intrigued me. It had a nice beat and music. But the song kind of confused me a minute, and I decided I'm not going to apply that to my life. The song was simply this. Let me sing you a portion. Been down. I've been down. I've been down so long. I don't mind being down. Been down. Been down. I've been down so long, I don't mind being down. So I wrote another verse. Got up, getting up. I've been up so long, I ain't ever going to get down again. Not much of a songwriter, but have me like my verse better than his. Come on, somebody say, I've been down. But I like what Psalm 30 and 5 says, weeping may endure for the night. Joy. Say it. Joy is going to come in the morning. Do you believe that? Can I paraphrase that? Weeping may be for the night, but it will turn. You know what that means? Just like God commands the sun to come across the horizon every morning, if you can't see it for the fog and the blizzard and the hail and the sleet, it's still coming across the the sky. Why? Because God turns everything from dark to light, from death to life, from defeat to victory. And I'm in this room today to tell a bunch of people that need to hear this, whatever it is you're labeling and whatever it is you're fighting, it will turn. And it will turn not just to bless you, but it will turn for a testimony testimony for everybody around you. How many of you want to be a testimony for the glory of God? Okay, God, take people in this room through terrible things this week so they can have a next greater testimony by next Sunday. Didn't get any in agreement, did I? Well, I don't want to ever go through anything. Well, how are you going to develop? You won't know how to counsel with people that have had their family walk away if yours hasn't on some level. I understand what it's like to counsel with people about somebody that they cared about that just didn't care about them back. But how many of you know that once you've been through a test, you can have some instructions? How do you think wise people became wise? They learned obedience through the things they suffered. 
some of the greatest books that have ever been written are people that went through stuff. Amen? We have soldiers coming back with no leg or no arm or no sight, whatever it is. They've been through some stuff. They can tell you what the battle is all about. We don't want it to be that way. But how many of you understand in the spiritual realm, any conflict you get in is going to turn around for a testimony? There's never a test that can wipe you out. There's never a test that can stop God's plan in your life. You will see the turnaround, and it will turn for a testimony. What is the testimony of Job? God gave him double portion of what he had, restored his wealth, restored his family, gave him new children. How many of you understand? The only thing that I don't think God did for him was give him a new wife. I think God just set her free. I think he was so wealthy he'd give her money to go down to Walmart and buy all those diamonds she wanted. Just a thought. Do they have diamonds at Walmart? Cut glass, whatever it is. <laughs> Listen to this. Joseph came to a time, I, I, I'm sure as a 17-year-old or whatever boy, he's got dreams from God, revelation from God. His, his dad even looks at him and rebukes him. The greatest man on earth at that time, the greatest religious leader, his name's Israel. He looked up to his father, and his father said, I rebuke you for that. What is this dream? It, that can't be of God. But how many know sometimes what is God don't look like God? You know why it doesn't look like God? Because you've never experienced that part of God yet. Anybody want to experience some parts of God you've never known? Do you want him just to be your Savior to live forever? Or when you're sick, would you like for him to show up as healer? Would you like for him to show up as finance when you're getting ready to get kicked out of the house? Everybody say, he's a problem solver. He's got all these accolades and all these titles and terms. And you know what? In ministry all these years, I found out that he can do all of them. There's never a situation I've ever faced that was too big for God. Songwriter said, you can't ask too much of God. How do they know that? Because they've asked bigger stuff than you could imagine, and God has always been the right on time. How many know the writer said he may not come when you want him, but he'll always be the right on time? Joseph didn't stay in the pit. Somebody said, well, yeah, his brother came and they bailed him out and made money off of him. Yeah, but that was a part of the plan of God. How many of you know that pit death experience was turned around so God could take him into Egypt and he could minister to Potiphar and the family and then he could go to jail and minister to jailers and then he could come out of prison come out of prison, and when he did, he had a revelation that saved the world from starvation and brought his father and his family to bow down before him, just like the original dream said. Some of us get rid of our dream before it's fulfilled. Am I right? Well, God told me this, but I don't think he's going to do it. You just nullified something that God wanted to do for you. You need to get back to believing. I say, well, I don't know how it's going to happen. It's not up to you to figure it out. He makes a way. When there was no earth, he created it. He made an earth or would be floating around here. There would be no courthouse. There would just be air. Okay, don't wrap your brain around that. There was no fish. Anybody like fish? Two hands. Thank you, God, for fish. <laughs> it's better for you than pork. Just, just a thought. But here's what I want to tell you. God, time after time on the life frame of Joseph, had to turn around what could have been his destruction. I got to tell you this. God just doesn't turn one situation in your life around or one part of the fulfillment of your prophecy around. He turns it all around. If you look at those cogs that are there uh, up on the screen, when one of those turn, they all have to turn. Whew, I love that. When one of them turns, they're connected. I just got to tell you, the one beside you getting ready to turn when you do. Mama, Daddy, when you get on fire for God a little bit more, they're going to get on fire for God a little more. When they see you reading the Word of God, they're going to read the Word of God. Every morning and night and midday, my family would pick up the Bible, and my mother and my father, one, would start reading it, and we would gather around, and then we'd have prayer. Somebody said, well, that's crazy. You don't have to do that. Well, 56 years later in the ministry, I still connect with God first thing in the morning, during my day, and at night. Why? Because it was instilled in me that once I can get my faith turning, it will affect everybody in my life. Did you know that you have an influence over everybody that's a part of your life? Wow. I've learned that, and I've been bugging you and helping you with this, but I want you to start allowing your Christianity to go to the workforce and to the grocery store, people at the gas station. That's why I talked about the little lady got out of her car, older lady at the gas station came over to me and she said, I just feel like giving up. I didn't know her. 
Can I just brag a little bit on God? And this is not a brag for me because I can't make this happen. But I feel like she had somebody she felt like could help her. She didn't know that. But when I got finished with her, God helped her and encouraged her. I want to live so people are drawn to me. Who do you think you are? Nothing but the God inside me thinks he's God. The Savior on the inside thinks he'd like for me to speak about him. Am I right? Where? Go tell it on the mountain, over the hill and everywhere, wherever you are. I just look for people I can bless. Matter of fact, right now, I think my neighbor's just kind of watching to see if I'm coming by. <laughs> Here he comes. Close the door. No, they keep it open because everybody's fighting something. How many of you recognize that if God had stopped turning situations around for Joseph, he would have got out of the pit but would have never got to Egypt safe. He would have died and starved in a hole in, in the desert. When God starts a promise in your life, he keeps the wheels turning until you get where you're going. How many of you are not finished yet? Anybody got to get another week, good week in you? <laughs> Anybody got another month? Anybody want to put it off till next year? No. Anybody want to just go on right now to heaven? Talk to Terry Summers maybe today at lunch and say, I got some people that want to come to you. How many not ready to go yet? Oh, please encourage me. Say, I want to be back next Sunday. Everyone, the, the, the people that we look at that look negative became positive. There was a young virgin girl named Mary, a spouse to a man named Joseph. And the word of the Lord came to her, you're going to have a baby. Well, right now, the, the child was in her, the child was developed. We know it was the baby Jesus. And from that moment on, the leader of the country tried to take him out, tried to kill the babies. He was so intent on killing the baby Jesus that he, he wiped out all the babies, not just a month old, not just a year old, but two years old and under, just to make sure he got the right one. The problem was he got all the wrong ones and Jesus escaped. Why? Because what the enemy meant for evil, God turned it around. And everything you read from now on, just earmark this. Don Young, put a PDY on there and say, Pastor told me that this is God changing and turning what the devil meant for evil. Can I say it to you? Whatever the devil meant for evil, God is going to turn it for good. Do you believe that? So what are you worried about? The only reason you need to worry about if you're not involved in the turning effect. How does it start turning? Trust in God. You don't have to know God completely. Nobody understands his ways are above finding out. But you've got to love him and you've got to want him. You've got to apply him. How many of you know if you don't have anybody in your life but God, you are rich. If nobody loves you but God, you're still loved. And if nobody cares about you, he will keep you for all of eternity. That's how much. How many of you understand he thought I was worth saving? Somebody ought to sing that song. <laughs> well, I don't know why he would like me because he made you and he made the dirt you came from. One day you're going to go back to dirt, but the God on the inside of you and the spirit he put on the inside of you is going to celebrate heaven forever and forever. Anybody want to live forever? Elbow your neighbor and tell them, I am, I'm seeing things turn today. Let me close. This is really hard, but I remember that Paul and Silas were in prison. We talk about these stories because they're easy to explain and they have value that we don't even recognize sometimes while we're reading it. These men were locked in prison. They were put in shackles after they beat their backs off. The flesh is hanging and they put them against the crude areas of, anybody remember those old days when they had those wooden things, they put you again, put chains around or they put metal straps around the hands and these men are leaning against rough wood or against a rough wall of a prison. They are bleeding out, if you will, and all of a sudden, instead of them thinking, you know what, trouble's going to last forever, we're never going to get out of this, this is going to last forever, and we're going to die tomorrow, they're going to kill our life. But they didn't do that. They said, you know what, I need to get the wheels turning for a miracle. And they started singing. I don't know what it was, but deliverance, deliverance is mine. I don't know what it was, but as they began to sing, God shook that place, and the shackles came off, not only off of them, but everybody that was with them in the prison. I said, well, brother, I, why did they have to go to prison? I'm glad you asked. So that they could have a testimony that God is more powerful than the confinement of prison. And also, all those other prisoners facing death with them, all of them accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. That would not have happened if they didn't go through a test. If I never had a problem, I'd never know God could solve them. 
Well, I don't know why I'm in prison. I know because the jailer and his family is going to get saved today and all the prisoners are going to find Jesus. Is it worth you going to a, a momentary time of affliction for God to bring eternal salvation to somebody that would not know it any other way? Would somebody say, God is getting ready to turn the wheel and all the cogs of the wheel are going to turn and I'm going to be one of those that are turning. I don't know about you. I'm going to go through some stuff. Dust don't get mad at me. I know as a preacher, as a father, as as a husband, I'm going to go through some things in my life, but I want the wheels to keep turning. I don't want to stay in bondage. I don't want to stay weeping. I don't want to stay in sorrow. I want the chains to be broken. That happens when God starts turning what the devil meant for evil, turning it into good. I'm so glad. Trouble don't last long. Okay. You know how those songs were written? Somebody thought it was going to last forever. Nothing lasts forever. Am I right? My hair used to be thick with a fro. Yes, I had a fro. And some of you got pictures you keep bringing back from those days. <laughs> okay, do you understand what a fro is? Brothers understand it. <laughs> Remember that? Remember those days? Oh, I wish I had that much hair. But hair don't last always. Hair's like troubles. What doesn't turn white falls out. And everything turns. So I don't know, you know, my hair is getting white and, you know, I'm starting to get some wrinkles. You know what that means? God kept you alive. How many of you would rather stay alive with a few wrinkles? I mean, you can dye that hair. <laughs> Nobody will know if you're 95 and have jet black hair that it's not real. Nobody will know. <laughs> Why are you laughing? So, well, you know what, I'm aging. Good, that means you're still alive. Is anybody getting older? Four hands went up. How many of you are getting better? No, how many of you are trusting and connecting with God so whatever he does, look at me, let me close. Whatever God does, you're connected to the gears that are turning. Whatever God is doing, I'm connected. We don't have any runners in this room today or somebody be running around the room. Say it, I'm connected in my pain, in my threats, to the gears that are ever turning. Nothing stays the same. Am I right? Say it, nothing stays the same. That's what life's all about. I look around and see some of these kids, and they got kids, and they got kids. You know why? Because things change. Now you got grandkids that look like you. And you're trying to talk them out of doing stuff you did that you shouldn't have done so they can have a better life than you. How many glad life is ever changing? Which means whatever you're fighting right now, don't expect it to be that way tomorrow. Well, the doctor told me this. Yeah, but don't expect that tomorrow. I talked with a dear friend in California. His wife took one of the statin drugs. Couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. She couldn't speak anymore. Her face got numb. Her mouth got numb. Her body began to get numb, and she was dying. They couldn't find any reason, and they just found out it was the pills they were giving her. Whew. Anybody ever read that small print on television when it says, take this, and you'll get over your headache? But you'll probably be suicidal and get cancer. Keep the headache. <laughs> we'll pray for that. I got a call from way many states away, and they said, would you pray for my husband's been taking a statin drug, the same thing. I'm not putting down statins. I don't know all about it. I just know that when I hear that name right now, both encounters are causing people to go numb and can't speak and can't swallow and can't eat. How many of you understand? I don't want that because I like to eat. Matter of fact, if you all say amen five more times, I'm going to get me a taco. <laughs> and while I'm there, we're going to minister to the waitresses and we're going to minister to the owners. How many of you understand? That's what life's all about. How many of you do like to eat? Don't act like you don't. Elbow your neighbor and tell them, how'd you get in that condition if you don't eat? Just see how brave you are. Let me close right here. Don't want you to listen. I've closed three times, but this one's going to work. Oftentimes in Scripture, we look at these stories. We wonder, why did these great men and women of God go through stuff? But notice, we don't ever stop to say they didn't continue to go through it. Even the Israelites on a 40-year journey because of the rebellions and disobediences for 40 years. They wanted to go back. They wanted to argue with God. They wanted to take over all that stuff. They didn't stay in the wilderness forever. I mean, there comes a time when the gears keep turning. It's going to get you somewhere. 
I got four tires on that car out there, and when that inside mechanism of the tire begins to turn, that axle begins to move, that car is going to go forward or backward. How many of you know it's done that for two, well, let me just say it, over a quarter of a million miles? Why do you believe you're going to make it home? Because it's not going to stop turning today. I am going to put the key in, put it in gear, and it's going to go forward. Everybody say, the wheels are going to turn. They will turn. That means I'm going to get from where I am to where I need to be. I may have to stop and get more gas. I may have to stop by the star, I may, I may, by the shell station. I may have to go and get something to eat, but I am not going to stay where I am physically or spiritually. Just like when this door is closed and you get in your car and you head out, you're not going to stay where you are right now. You're going forward. So it is in the kingdom. Whatever is going on wrong in your life, it will turn again for a testimony. Everything will works together for the good. Can everybody say, I'm ready for the turn and for the testimony? Would you look at your neighbor and say, can you see me turning? Shake your head. If I'm not, jumpstart me, shock me, do something. We're in this thing together. One of the biggest problems we have across the earth and even in church is thinking that this thing is not going to change. Some of you have loved ones and you've watched them remain the same they got an attitude they got a reason they got an excuse why they don't want to serve God and live forever we justify it we validate it we say that's okay they got hurt doesn't matter how hurt you are you got to believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ if you believe him you'll love him you'll serve him you'll give him your all how many of you understand it's not about just liking Jesus amen you stand before St. Peter if he's going to do that and he's not with your iPhone say "I, I like Jesus on my phone I liked him I even shared him with two people. I don't know you're not saved because of anything but believing and trusting and serving him. Am I right? I want you to bow your head. The Spirit is saying something strong in this room today. I don't want you to lose heart. As a matter of fact, I'm praying that the hardest cases in this room, your children, your loved ones, your companions, whatever it takes for the turn, whatever it takes for the change, here's the question. You're going to be in the house with them when the change begins to take place. The confusion, the the rebellion, the fighting off what you've been telling them. Are you willing for God to do whatever he chooses to do to bring restoration? Ask yourself, am I really willing to go through this? Am I willing for God to begin the turnaround? I know he can. If he can cause 10 leprous, rotting men to be changed in a moment. If he can cause 5,000 starving people to be fed by five loaves and two fish. The death threat, the starvation was turned around in an hour. Whatever you're fighting and whatever rebellious spirit has clung to your loved ones. I got to talk preacher talk for just a moment. I never thought we would get to the place that we are in this country and in the church where we're starting to sell out, sell out for popularity, what people care about us and what people think. No, we're living right now, and I watch people, and you will have the same thing happen. People will get out of your environment. They'll walk away from you because you stand up for righteousness and eternal truth. Don't don't take it personally. They're not hating you. They're hating the God that lives in you. If I stand here and tell you a lie and doom and damn your soul, I'm not your friend, and I'm not your pastor. I am a bought-out liar. I will not do that. There are those that have been talking about it. Thank God the word is beginning to stir in ministry where people are saying we can't bow down to the lies and find the truth of victory. We can't bow down to letting sin have its rent and way in our lives and still expect to walk in victory. The promises come when we obey the Lord. The promises come when we believe God. The promises come when we accept salvation and victory. Can everybody say this with me? I'm going to stand up for righteousness. Stand up for truth. I want everyone to stand to your feet for just a moment. There are some things that are very critical, and we're going to be dealing with them at length because we're living in an hour where we can't just think about God once in a while or we can't just talk about that sweet Holy Spirit once in a while. But it's going to have to rule and reign in our life. It has to be the thing that lords over us, and every attitude and every situation has to change. I've made up my mind in seeking God this week above any time in my life that God will begin to cause the chains to be broken and cause the wheels of the chains 
change to begin to be activated. And I believe with all of my heart, you're going to want it like you've never wanted it. You're going to crave it like never before. Well, I think I'm okay where I am. No, where we are is not where we want to be. It's not where God wants us to be in the future. There's a plan, a purpose for God. I want everybody in the room, if you will, to lift up your right hand and say, Father God, I claim your spirit as it rules and reigns in my life. Father, you said if a wicked earthly father loves to give good gifts to his children, how much more our heavenly father loves to give good gifts to those that love him, even the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is God's spirit. We've tried to make it into a spooky thing. It's not. It's God's loving, empowering spirit. There are those of you in this room, the Spirit of the Lord is in your life. I know that. His presence is there. I'm going to ask you to desire the best gifts. I'm going to ask you to desire that the fruit of the Spirit will begin to work and the gifts of the Spirit will begin to work. I'm going to ask you to do what the Bible said. Seek earnestly the best gifts. Thank God we're desiring it again. We're desiring revival. And revival doesn't come because we put out big posters. It doesn't come because we have a sign on the billboard that said revival for three days. No, it comes because we're hungering for the presence of God that breaks down the barriers of sin and bondage and draws people to eternity and draws people to Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask every one of you in this room to begin to ask God to activate the power of the gift of the Spirit in your life. Allow the activation of the Holy Ghost in your life. That's the only only thing that's going to save and deliver those around you is if somebody is praying and somebody's agreeing and somebody's allowing his presence to have its will in his way. Brother Guy, I'm not fluent in those gifts. God's desire for us is that we begin to seek it. While every head is bowed and no one is looking around, I, I just want to talk to you as, as though you and I are the only ones in this room. How many of you would like for God's Spirit not only to be upon you, but to be able to pray life-changing prayers through you. That's what praying in the Spirit does. Sometimes you haven't got the language yet, but the Bible said there's a groaning inside of you prayer that you pray while you're groaning in the spirit. You're craving a salvation. You're craving a deliverance, a healing, a miracle. And the Lord is saying begin right there. Begin to cry out to God and let the spirit cry out because when we pray in the spirit, God may give you just a few words or a stammering lip to begin with, but it's privately a personal gift that God has given to you. That's what brings the turnaround. That's what brings the change. His spirit has provided every miracle that has ever happened. It's provided every salvation, every deliverance that's ever happened. And if we have that gift inside of us, begin to seek earnestly that God will give you a fluent language that you can talk to God, just you and Him personally. Because there's times that we don't know how to pray as we ought to pray. But the Spirit prays through us, whether it's a word Paul said, sometimes I pray in the Spirit, other times I pray with understanding, and sometimes there's a groaning inside of me that I cannot even utter. That's compassion trying to find its way out through your mouth. That's compassion caring for somebody that's going to die without God if you don't get a miracle. I believe that God has promised this family salvation, but we got to begin to believe for it. We got to begin to pray it in the Spirit. We got to begin to believe it in the Spirit. From the morning until the night, all this week has been very vital to me that what you can't fix and the people you can't change, you don't even know how to ask God because you don't know what they're fighting. You don't know what they would accept. You don't know what word they would rebel against. You don't know what would turn them off or on. But the Holy Spirit knows how to reach down inside the heart, the mind, the soul, and the body. I'm going to ask everyone to lift your hands, and I want you to do this. God said, if you'll ask Him, He will give you the power of His Spirit. Can all of us say it? Those of you that have it and those of you that have never received it. Will you lift your hands and say, I ask you, Father God, give me the gift of your Spirit. I will yield to the fruit of the Spirit. I will yield to the gifts of the Spirit. And I will pray in the Spirit and with understanding and with groanings because God knows what my heart is screaming about when I don't know how to say it. I release it, Father, to the power of manifestation. In this room today, there are some of you that don't realize how valuable you are and the value of your prayer and your authority. When the power of the Spirit begins to work and the revelation begins to come, it's not about a show-off. It's not about any of that. It's about you talking to God and letting Him hear 
his word flowing through you. There's times I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to pray. So I just let the spirit in groanings and in utterances in the tongue that he gave me. And also when I didn't have the understanding, I let his spirit begin to pray. I'm asking God to baptize every one of you afresh in the power of the Holy Ghost. I said, what do you mean ghost? It means God's spirit. What is the spirit? It's love. It activates every good and perfect gift. I want you to get somebody on your heart right now, every one of you in the room. Somebody that if God doesn't turn them around, they don't have much longer to live. I'm going to tell you, saints, I trust you. And God trusts you. He trusts you to intercede for those that can't intercede for themselves. He trusts you to let his spirit. Well, brother, I know how to do that. Just let God's spirit speak to you and through you. It'll start off different for every one of you, but once you begin to seek it, it'll come out, either an audible word or it'll come back as a groaning. The desire of your heart is going to have its right away and its will. I want us to pray together. I want you to come and help me for just a moment, if you will. Thank you, Lord. Amy, come on now. I want the body of Christ, if you will, to look inside of your heart and ask yourself, am I willing and ready for God to speak? Look up at me for just a minute. How many have ever been frustrated because you pray and you pray and you pray and nothing's changing? Not just for yourself, but how many know sometimes it takes other people to make your life complete? Angie, through the most heart-wrenching times of your life, it was God's Spirit praying through you. I've seen it on your face. I've seen it on the quivering of your lips and the prayer bringing comfort. We'll go back for just a moment and remember those weeks after Wesley was called home. God's Spirit is the only thing that kept you sane. He gave you peace. While we were preaching and praying today, the Lord said to tell you that turnaround of emotions, that turnaround of great overwhelming pain, begin to let you walk in a path of new peace, and new reason to live, and new joy. Today, the Lord spoke to my heart, and I saw a shackle being broken. And the Father is saying, Tell her it will turn. Let's give God some praise for just a moment. And you're not in this thing by yourself. We stood with you by Wesley, and we grieved, and we cried, and we broke, and we hurt. But we're laughing now, and we're remembering his smiles and the funny stuff he did, and eating too many marshmallows in the Amish territory until he got sick. That's what we remember now more than the grief. And God is saying, I'm going to turn around the lives of those you placed in my hands. As you begin to pray this in the Spirit, Angie, pray in the Spirit until the manifestation of the miracle has its completed work. I promise you I'm in agreement and league with you until we watch it. I'm tired of the enemy taking our young'uns and our loved ones and our mamas and daddies, drag them to the hog pen for a while. I don't want them. They've been there long enough. I want there to be an awakening to come to the Father's table, be an awakening to come. God, you said it, and I've spoken it today. This will turn, and this will all have to turn if we're going to have our joy complete, and you promise complete joy, joy unspeakable, full of glory. I release it in the name of Jesus. Amy, I don't know if you realize the testimony that you have been for those that didn't hear much from your word, but they watched you praising God as you looked around and you saw your son and you looked around and you saw the questions in the mind of the people and you recognized he loved, he believed, he trusted. But something happened unexpected, but I watched you keep on praising. I watched your lips quivering as you begin to speak to God in a heavenly language that comforted you through the pain of the sorrow that is the most unbearable thing that a mother or a father or a family member can endure. And the Lord said to Michael, come on home, son, it's your time. You were left behind with the same spirit of restoration working inside of you. I'm saying this to you together, both of you, because I realize that we talk about those things and times when it doesn't seem possible that we will live again. 
love again and laugh again. But Amy, the fulfillment of your ministry that God's already told you is going to come. Whatever situations and roadblocks and hindrances, they will turn out of your way. And God is going to let you see the most effectiveness because of the turnaround that's taking place. Sometimes through great trials, some through great fires, some through great floods, some through great tribulation, but we all come through the blood. I release you from all this, the darkness and the clouds and the memories of the pain and the regrets. I release you to know that heaven is brighter. Eternity is more precious. Thank you, Father, because you've whittled away all those hindering things. The smoothness of life is going to let her penetrate places she's never been. Have a testimony she would not have had had she not walked through these fires. I release you to the completed victory and the completed joy. Would everybody say it all turns for a testimony? Am I right? Say it turns for a testimony. How are we going to tell others what God can do if we've never experienced it for ourselves? How many of you have some, let's look at me a minute. How many of you have someone or something that you don't know if God can do? Well, yeah, but they got to want it. How many understand it's our job to pray that they will want it? God's bringing changes. The tenderness of your heart will fix it. Lisa, the same thing that looked like I can't face anymore is turning now into a testimony for everybody that you meet. Matter of fact, you haven't screamed and yelled out loud and preached from the pulpit. But watching your life and your trust has caused a lot of people to realize all that matters is having Jesus in our life. I honor you because I recognize it's not been easy, but it's turning. The wheel is turning back to you're going to live again. You're going to love again and laugh again. And just be very blunt. What God started in what looked like the most horrible thing is going to cause your whole family to be stirred and shaken. That's what you're praising. God. If we never had a shakeup, we'd never have a change. Doesn't seem fair. I know that. But God's smart. And He knows what's best for the long haul. And He's working it for His glory. How many of you willing to get in with both feet? Anybody tired of being baptized by having one toe in the water? Anybody want to jump all in? Come on, look at me. If God's going to bring revival through Spirit of Truth and through you and your family, it's going to work in us. I'm going to ask you to set aside time and just private before the Lord. Ask Him to begin to speak to you and speak through you heavenly blessings. Father, I right now reach out and we touch Linda. I ask you, Father, to break off whatever and all that it is. And Father, I'm not going by sight today. I'm going by the faith of the living God. I don't know what her body is depleted of and I don't know what she needs added or removed, but you do. And all the healing potion is in the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, I ask you right now to restore. And I'm asking you to break off whatever shackle is holding her at this spot. And you said to me to say it to the body and you've never lied and you've never ever spoken a word through me that was false to your people. Linda, I believe with all of my heart this too will turn and this will become the greatest testimony. That's what I believe, and that's what I know you believe, and I want the body to say together, we do believe that this is beginning to turn. Say it, it begins to turn. The cogs of the wheel are there to take us places we've never been yet. Had we not gone through this thing like Job, if we had not gone through this time of pain and just oppression like Elijah, not wanting to live unless this changes God gave double portion back to Job and he gave the influence and the power of the Holy Spirit to transfer a double portion to Elisha and the world has had an eternal impact because of that. I ask you, Father, turn this into a testimony. Those that look at her and wonder if her God is real. Those that look at her and wonder if the healer is still healing and the deliverer is still delivering. I want you to touch their lives. And it may have taken this valuable thing through her to cause them to wake up for eternity and to wake up to follow the path of God that she wants them to walk upon with her. And I release all these things and I command the commanded blessing. Keep the wheels turning, Father, to get her from this valley to the next mountaintop and the next one and the next one and the next one in Jesus' name. It's all right, Linda, just let it happen. 
I keep hearing this and I see the quivering of the lips and the Lord is saying, I will work through my spirit speaking through you because it first speaks to you. You'll never understand those words in English, but they will come forth as manifestation. Everybody, just for a moment, I want you to begin to pray. There's some of you realize your mama, your daddy, they spoke in a language you didn't understand. My father did, my mother did. That's why after all these years, I've been through a thousand valleys and mountains, but I believe that I'm stronger now than I've ever been to believe in God because, because, because what I've had to go through to learn, to develop and to grow. Can you say it out loud with me? Prophesy it. My future is brighter than my past. My help comes from the Lord. He makes heaven and earth. Come on, somebody say, He makes heaven and earth. And I receive your life. I receive your strength. Would everybody say, everybody around me will benefit by me. I choose it to be for the good. I will lead people to God, not away from God. I'll lead people to truth and not comfort them in their life. I speak hope. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lisa, just grab Ton on that side, if you will, and touch Donna. Ton, everyone that's a part of your life are being affected. And I saw God today beginning to fan the flame of who you are in Him and who He is in you. There's people that you can have an impact on that I will never know. There's people that will never know God or eternal life because they don't know me and I can't tell them. But the Lord said he's watching your footsteps beginning to lead them out of death, out of weakness, out of defeat into victory. I speak life and peace today. My whole house. My whole house. My whole house. Some of you never thought a year, two, three years ago you'd be where you are. You could not have planned what's going on in your life. But it took God. It took God. I stand right now representing my family. And whatever bondages or hindrances or thoughts or memories or attitudes or hurts, I take the authority by the power of the Spirit to break off reasons and excuses. Whatever is a blockade from my future. It ain't over yet. It's only just begun. The promises have started fresh today. In the name of Jesus. Will you say it with me? My promises are turning from defeat, turning to victory. My body is turning from sickness to health. My life turning from defeat to completed manifestation of my Father God's promises. Will you lift your hand and say, I will be what God called me to be. And to do that, I need my health, so I receive it. I need finance, so God opened the windows of heaven, I receive it. I need excitement in my life again. And I receive it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes the hardest things to say are the simplest. If you love me, look at me. Do this with me one more time. Say the wheels are turning. And everything negative is heading to the positive. Everything of death is being left behind. My heavenly Father is going to give me my family. Look at me. What would eternity be like without them? Be diligent in your prayer for your loved ones. There's times you want to go shake them. There's times you want to go talk to them. Anybody ever want to just go tell people how to do it? Just fix them. How many of the best thing you could do is just stop where you are and speak in a language that God understands, just pray. You don't have to understand what it is. Just say, God, you know what I'm trying to say. Holy Spirit, pray through me. And I promise you, God's going to break down the walls and the shackles. And God's going to give us back what the devil stole. 
Everybody in agreement say, I am whole. I am blessed. I am healed. I am strengthened. And I'm rich. Well, it's on the way. How many of you are blessed? Would you look at your neighbor and tell them, God's talking to you today. You're responsible. Mama, daddy, brother, sister, you're responsible. Live it. Come on, somebody say, live it. And God will live through you. Say this, Father, as we go from this place, we will leave physically, but we carry the anointing. A new revelation of truth. Because the wheels of God are beginning to turn in us to take us to that final mountaintop, to take us to the completion and fullness and the manifestation of what you've already started. Sorry for being disappointed for a while. Sorry for forgetting that you always turn everything again for a testimony. Forgive me. And right now, everything is turning for a testimony and for the glory of God. Everybody that believes it in agreement say amen. Look at your neighbor and tell him he's preaching to you and he's preaching to me, so let's go out and eat.